This is the Voice of Early Childhood podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Voice of Early Childhood podcast. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Sue Allingham who is an author, consultant and trainer. Thank you so much for joining me today and our lovely listeners. It's an absolute pleasure and on such a beautiful sunny morning as well. Yeah, it's fantastic. I feel like that I'm on summer holiday. summer is finally summer. coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so today we are doing a quick episode on practical kind of tips, solutions, the practical aspects of educator well-being, because we had this conversation that actually a lot of the time we talk about well-being um, in a way where it's more almost, in on one hand, theoretical, and on another hand, you know, we're sort of talking about the challenges, but what about thinking about those solutions and having listeners, educators take something away that they can um, start to implement in their practice every single day? I've, I'm so glad you asked me about this because um, people listening might actually know that well-being is one of my things mm. that I talk about a lot. And in fact, the most significant part of a well-being for me is to have a cup of tea on hand when I'm talking, <laughs> <laughs> something nice to drink in a nice cup. So you'll be sipping away then. For I will be sipping away. <laughs> That's OK with you. That's absolutely um, fine. <laughs> because it is part of well-being. Part of well-being is to have a nice environment, mm-hmm. um, flowers, sunshine, nice pictures, things that make you feel happy. And it's really mm-hmm. interesting, as I say, that you asked me to do this at the end of um, the emotional um, no, emotional health week, but also mm-hmm. when I've been thinking about it a lot. And I read a report that was called The Working Lives of Teachers and Leaders, and it talks okay. about well-being in that as well. It's April 2023, so it's new. Mm-hmm. And it was very significant to me as I read through it. A particular thing jumped out at me, that primary teachers feel less of a sense of well-being than secondary teachers do. And, mm-hmm. of course, primary teachers encompasses the whole um, early years foundation stage and also I would argue um, the people in non-maintained settings as well Mm -hmm. so why do we feel less of a sense of well-being and if we don't have a sense of well-being why do we expect it from the children Mm -hmm. yeah so the more I think about this the more I think about and you and I said this a bit earlier before we started recording I, I go to so many schools and nurseries and playgroups and various, mm-hmm. you know, settings where well-being seems to be, oh, let's have a treat on a Friday. Mm-hmm. Let's have chocolates and fruit or a nice lunch brought in on a Friday. Yeah. Let's give the children golden, and I'm going to do the Joey from Friends, golden time mm-hmm. on a Friday. Mm-hmm. But what about the other four days in the week? Mm -hmm. And also, what about the weekends? How do people really feel? Do they really feel their own emotional well-being is supported? Because it's more than just how you feel in your head. It's how you feel all over. And also, when you're a very small child, if you're collecting, I don't know, marbles, Mm pom-poms, picks on a chart, because you know you're going to get, and I'm going to do it again, golden time Mm -hmm. on Friday afternoon for a couple of hours, that's years away, isn't it? Mm, for sure. In yeah. grown-ups' heads, we can rationalise, okay, well, we're going to get a nice, we're all going out for a drink or we're all having pizza in the staff room or something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We can kind of rationalise it, but in a child's head, that's forever. Mm-hmm. So how about the day-to-day stuff? What happens every day for our emotional well-being? Now, I've already said it's things like having all your favourite nice things around you. If I slide to one side, you can see Teddy mm-hmm. Edward behind me sitting there. <laughs> oh, yes, I can see him. <laughs> I don't Have you actually met Teddy Edward, Andrew? I haven't met him in person. I've seen him. I've seen lots of photos of him on Twitter. Yes, he comes kind of up like a lot In your bags, things. in your suitcases. You take yes, him with yes, you yes, all yes, the time yes. to training. <laughs> yep. He comes to a lot of training. And again, people listening to this may very well have met him in person because he does come out a lot mm-hmm. he gets stuffed into cases and taken to <laughs> Wales and things like that poor thing if I'm in the car he gets his own seat with a seatbelt <laughs> <laughs> because he was part of our well-being in my reception classes uh-huh. okay um because who doesn't need a cuddle mm. 
And if, when you're very little and you've got a big bear in your class who's part of the environment, who has his own name card, his own backpack, mm-hmm. his own uniform, his own PE kit, he comes everywhere with us when mm-hmm. we move around the building. If you're sad and you have a teddy who's about half your size, why wouldn't you cuddle him? Mm-hmm. Why wouldn't you have that few minutes out and just give it a cuddle? I have two cats. Again, you might be able to see them in that picture at the top. Someone painted them for me. (laughs) Cats, animals, soft toys, a school pet. I don't know if schools have pets very often, but sometimes they do. A guinea pig, a hamster, something like that. Something tangible, whether it's live or um, a toy mm-hmm. to talk to that isn't judgmental and I think mm-hmm. that's important it's there every day it doesn't judge you if you want to go and whisper in its ear and tell it your sorrows whether it be as I say a cuddly toy or a live creature mm-hmm. it's not judging you and I worry very much about the fact that we've just that report about lives of teachers mm-hmm. suggests that well-being and anxiety levels in primary teachers is higher than it is in secondary teachers. Mm-hmm. Why is that? I mean, I'm not saying secondary teachers don't have it, mm-hmm. but how is this met? How is this dealt with? Or is more pressure put? Excuse me, put on. And I know when you and I last talked, we had a t- lot of talk about pressure mm-hmm. from various um, central bodies. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. When I'm doing my well-being talks and my emotional awareness talks, I often say to people, take five minutes, step back, breathe, and just watch what happens. Mm -hmm. I think so often in our role as early years teachers, we feel pressure all the time to be seen to be doing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, if we're kind of sat back and observing a child, we're seen as not doing anything and being exactly not working. But actually, we're really tuning into the child. We're really closely observing, um, listening, and I guess it is what Julie Fisher talks about. You know, interacting or interfering. Exactly. Taking that step back to not interfere and figure out: Do we interact here? Do we kind of go in and scaffold the child's learning? Yeah, it's exactly that. And do you know what? I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to zone out. And I don't mean for hours. <laughs> I mean, think actually, do you know what? My heart's racing. I can't think straight. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing next. I'm just going to sit here and maybe take a Teddy Edward moment. Mm, yeah because I was going to say actually yeah. you know you were saying about Teddy Edwards supporting children and and you know them giving Teddy a cuddle and, and having yes. a conversation it can support the practitioner as well obviously not necessarily saying go and have a chat with Teddy Edwards you know but maybe just that medium of right okay you know what I'm just gonna sit down with the Teddy and the children may actually then recognize that and think oh Um, so-and-so you know my teacher um, the practitioner is actually sat down and having a little reflective moment or maybe they're feeling completely it's that modeling isn't it they may actually think to go over and have a little chat and then that open dialogue with the child is important oh that's lovely yeah i'm feeling exactly that that. (laughs) exactly that i mean obviously the teacher might fall asleep in which case (laughs) but (laughs) no i absolutely agree it's about how we model to the children and i think Mm -hmm. i said just now if we're in anxious and our well-being is not easy to deal with Mm -hmm. the children notice it too yes and it's completely reflected on the children and they absorb that energy and i guess they also and perhaps mirror that energy as well always and And i was thinking about this yesterday um again reading that report it talks about Mm -hmm. behavior issues and you and i both know and the people listening will know that loads of social media threads talk about the children's behavior my children Mm -hmm. won't sit still my children Mm -hmm. won't tidy up my children won't do this my children won't do that apart from anything else the last three years hasn't been easy in a young child's Mm -hmm. life And they've seen their adults perhaps getting very stressed about pandemic or perhaps things have happened to them because of pandemic or in their lives anyway. Mm -hmm. If they then see their adult at school or in their setting where perhaps they spend the most of their time stressed and anxious about things Mm -hmm. or maybe trying very hard to get their children to sit down 
oh 45 minutes to an hour to do phonics mm. oh god oh my goodness have you seen that or uh, i have i know it for a fact i've seen it uh there are schools oh out there for example that want the youngest children from day one and i've been in one of these schools mm. to sit down for 45 minutes first thing in the morning but we know they can't sit still for more than 10 minutes at that age generally, well uh, yeah generally speaking Unless they're really actively engaged in what's happening and involved yeah. and they're hanging on your your words and they want to know mm -hmm. more, it's a really good story or something they're really interested in. And I find that fascinating because part of your emotional well-being is your physical well-being. Mm -hmm. I said to you, didn't I, I think, before we started recording that my back's a bit achy. Mm, yeah. So I brought in a cushion and put it behind my back, which has now mm -hmm. made me feel a lot more comfortable. Mm-hmm. When you're two, three, four, five, and you're not still familiar with everything your body is capable of, mm -hmm. sitting, and many places expect cross-legged, sitting cross-legged for, oh, well, more than double your age, really. So mm -hmm. like you said, 10 minutes maximum, unless you're really engaged in what's happening, it's really uncomfortable. Mm, yeah. And actually, why do we insist on cross-legged? Because that's not that comfortable either. No, it's not. It's just because that's the way how it's always been. Exactly. Yeah. And there's that whole, if it ain't broke, don't fix it mantra, mm. isn't it? And it keeps children from moving and around and being able to stand up quickly, doesn't it? Because if they're sat on their knees, like the, when I sit down, I'm always kind of, even on a chair sometimes, I've got my knees tucked under myself. And then that's like an easier way to get up for children off the carpet, isn't it? But if they're cross leg, they're kind of a bit more fixed. And they it's, yeah, there. and it's so just guess... because it looks neat and tidy in our adult perception. Mm -hmm. And I talk about a lot perception. I talk a lot about whose agenda is it. Mm -hmm. And when you're very little and your body is still finding itself in space, your proprioception and how it works and what happens and mm -hmm. your muscles are still developing, your core strength. Actually, why can't you lie down and listen? Mm, yeah. People laugh at me sometimes when I do my um, involvement and well-being trainings. And I say to people, but look, this is about your well-being. If you want to lie on the mat mm -hmm. and listen to me, that is absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. If you want to sit on the floor or however you want to sit, as long as you're involved and engaged mm -hmm. in what we're talking about, I don't mind. And it's about that feeling of comfort and security, isn't it? Yep. And it's about comfort and then that of comfort and um concentration levels mm -hmm. and understanding that i'm actually the most comfortable like this therefore i can listen to you and take in what you're saying mm -hmm. i might have my back to you but i'm actually writing down everything you're saying mm -hmm. yeah i might be fiddling with a pencil i mean how many of us doodle when we're listening to a conference mm-hmm yeah, and it, and it may be seen as rude sometimes. And, you know, it's what I often do is take notes on my phone now. I used to do it on my laptop, but actually yeah. getting out a laptop is a bit too bulky when you sat on those little, you know, sometimes little conference chairs. So I do it on my phone and, and I've been doing it for a while now. And I'm still struggling with that thought of people are going to judge me for being on my phone, but actually I'm taking so many notes. And if I don't take notes, I don't take it in. It's not just, yeah. a lot of the time I won't read the notes back, um, which seems you know silly. It's why you're taking them. Yeah, but all, but actually I need to be doing something to keep my focus because yeah. I'm someone that thinks so much about so many things and gets distracted. I can't focus on that person speaking. I have to be taking notes at the same time for it to go in. And I think with children, it's exactly what you mentioned. It's the same thing. You know, why do we recognize it with adults? But sometimes we don't with children in terms of fiddling or looking away because actually directly looking at someone talking may not actually give them that focus. They need to be looking at something else. Yeah. I mean, for it, away from you might the want to be staring at Teddy Edward. Yeah. <laughs> or if you are having a hold of Teddy Edward while the adult's talking about mm -hmm. phonics, let's say for sake of argument, and you've got your face buried in his head, Mm -hmm. That might be your way of listening. Mm -hmm. And that's all about your well-being again. And as you say, yeah. we recognise these things in adults sometimes, but mm -hmm. we don't in children. Um, and I've just recently as well been reading stuff about children having a set place on the carpet. As in like their own spot, their little yes. nice coloured spot. And they have I to sit on the same spot whenever they sit on the carpet. I find that interesting too. 
reflecting back hundreds of years ago when I was still a class teacher, <laughs> we had um, 30 carpet square samples from the local carpet shop, mm-hmm. which he gave to me for 50 pence a throw or something because he wasn't going to throw them away. Oh, wow. And mm-hmm. the children just took their carpets, a carpet square in the morning and sat wherever they wanted to. Mm. But they had their little carpet square, which they, was almost they like could a, just was, take one. It didn't matter yeah. which one it was. There was, I mean, some of them had their own favourite one. Of course, they did because mm. they were different colours. But it didn't matter where they sat mm-hmm. because you don't always want to sit in the same place, do you? No, and you don't always want to sit next to the same person. Mm-hmm. And it's those little details about the adult agenda impacting mm. on the children's well-being. Yeah, and as I, I mean, we were saying this, the whole thing is all about chocolates in the staff room and um, golden time on a Friday, mm-hmm. and how it's all very well to say to a child, "Well, if you sit nicely, I'll put I don't know a fluffy ball or a marble in the pot, and then we can all have golden time." <laughs> so, what's sitting nicely? Mm. In whose opinion? I say that yeah. a lot as well. Plus, there's that extrinsic motivation rather than the <sighs> intrinsic motivation of you know what. Yeah. Am I doing this because I want to do yeah. this? Or and in whose just... opinion is it sitting nicely? Yeah. And do you know what? I really not bothered about golden time. I'd rather be comfortable now. Mm-hmm. And this whole—I mean, I think the whole thing that drives well-being is in whose opinion is it well-being? Mm. And it's—I think it reflects back on what you said earlier about if the adult feels that they can have five minutes with Teddy Edward or to sit in the chair calmly. Or mm-hmm. to sit with their own book and have a little read. Mm-hmm. Um, or maybe to tend the plants or something for them. And plants, obviously, yeah. is a great well-being. Something a little uh, bit I've just realised that thinking about your plant in the background, perhaps mm-hmm. my background now is too distracting. As in for like the, so like for myself, if I'm yes. kind of looking at you. And to, to be honest, <laughs> I kind of almost didn't um, consciously think that, but... Now you say it, I I have been kind of looking mm. and yeah, distracting myself. Somebody the other day like. asked me what did my board say, my um, light board at the bottom there. What did that say? Because mm. they've been trying to work it out all the way through oh, the whole time, <laughs> just staring at it, <laughs> trying to read it, and you were just like talking yeah. away. <laughs> actually, it should be outside on the windowsill by the front door, but there's nobody at home because what it actually is is a light board that warns people I'm recording so they don't come in. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very useful being faced but there's reason. nobody in the in the house apart from me so cats can't read so. <laughs> but the whole going back to this well-being thing again mm-hmm. i think it the basic fundamental principle of all of this is in whose opinion mm-hmm. what do i know about the people around me and this is adults and children alike that mm-hmm. i know makes them feel comfortable yeah and you're aware and i expect lots of people listening to all of this will be aware of my work on the Leuven Scales of Wellbeing and Involvement. Mm-hmm. And if you start to reflect on how do I know that person, whether it be an adult or a child, is feeling secure in themselves and has a good sense of well-being, mm-hmm. then you start to notice things. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, this isn't a well-being training session. That's for another day or another event. Mm-hmm. But um if you just hold on to the tagline from Farrah Lavers himself, that if you have a good sense of well-being or level of well-being, you feel like a fish in water. And that is a massively powerful image if you think about it, because we can all visualise that fish when you take it out of the water and it panics. Mm, yeah. But immediately mm-hmm. back in the water, it's smooth and glides. Mm-hmm. And if we start to then think about how we feel, And is some chocolate on the staff room table at the end of the week going to make it better? Mm. Or some donuts midweek? For for leaders, it's about tuning into the individual team members rather than just thinking, this is what someone else in another setting is doing. This is what this trainer said. This is what this book says. I'm going to do this. This is their perception of well-being. Actually, what does that individual whether it's the child or the the adult what do they need to support their well-being exactly. and it, it's that thing that i i'm so passionate about of being critical um that critical reflection 
you know, and tuning into your your team, your community, your children. What does it mean for them? Just because someone said this doesn't mean it works. You know, you need to apply it to that. Yeah, and I've got individual. in front of when you said that to me once before, I wrote it on my whiteboard. I've got critical consumer written down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I've talked Love about that. golden time a lot throughout this. And of course, mm-hmm. the other one there is circle time. Mm-hmm. And these are labels, and I'm not a big fan of labels. Labeling anything immediately makes people think they have to do it. Mm, So we've got golden time, we've got circle time, we've got, um, what did I say, marbles in jars and Mm -hmm. pom-poms in jars and ticks on charts Mm -hmm. and smiley faces and sad Mm -hmm. faces and all of this stuff, which you need to be that critical consumer. Mm Mm-hmm. Because does it work for you? It's very easy to ask children to stick their face, stick a sticker of a face on their name when they come in every day to indicate how they feel when they come in. Mm -hmm. It's possible maybe that you do that with adults as well. I don't know. Maybe there are some staff rooms around the country that do that. But is that child being honest? Mm-hmm. As that child, even the youngest child, realise that if they stick a smiley face on the board, then you're happy. Mm-hmm. And if and they stick same. a sad or an angry face on the board, you don't really notice. And if they do, does anyone follow it up and see what's mm-hmm. the matter? Mm. Or was um, it just a tick box thing that's done because somebody suggested it on Facebook? Yeah, exactly. And, and I was going to say also, it's so much more than that too. So... You know, sometimes you may be, if there's that binary choice of happy or sad or somewhere in between, there's so much more going on there. And it's, mm-hmm. it's you kind of almost feel like, well, I don't want to choose any of those because actually I just that feel kind of, <laughs> yeah, or, and it, and it, then it just kind of misses the point of, well, actually I'd like to talk about this and I, and I can't put myself, I don't have um, a capacity to express exactly how I feel or put myself in that, you know, binary um box that smiley face because I'm feeling a lot of different things and I'm feeling Mm. sad and happy at the same time because of this and because of that and actually I don't know how I feel Mm -hmm. actually I just don't want to be here today Mm. I wonder what um, I guess this is this may be even like us going into kind of product development now (laughs) (laughs) but um, I wonder what can be done to spark that discussion and conversation so I guess rather than pick a smiley face it's more about perhaps that carpet or circle time if we want to kind of call it that but or you know that group activity or sitting down with one child but having perhaps a teddy that we pass around and and discuss it so um Aaron Bradbury was talking to me about this the other day actually it's about Mm -hmm. connection um and really tuning into each child and, and connecting with the child and with the group and having that time and space to interact um, so it really can be about sparking those conversations rather than just that little tick box activity of put your name in a jar, put a smiley face on here. I completely agree with you. It's And he's absolutely right with that time thing because um, he talks a lot about nurturing, doesn't he? Yeah, exactly. That's the conversation we were having. But it's time. I mean, earlier on I said about take a deep breath and take five minutes and stand back and look. Mm-hmm. Because of the pressure that is felt by teachers across the piece from the early years upwards. And remember, I say teachers when I I mean everybody, teachers with a small T. Mm. That's important here because whenever children cross our threshold, whether it be in our childminding um, provision or in Mm -hmm. our church hall or in our day nursery or in our school, as soon as the children come in, we're teaching them something. Yeah. And obviously, if we're anxious and stressed, they see it. Mm -hmm. My friend Catherine, who's in America now, she's actually Australian, um, she talks about emotional backpacks. And as the adults, we spend a lot of time making sure, hopefully making sure the children see our best selves. Mm -hmm. And we park everything that we're feeling in our emotional backpacks until the end of the day. Mm -hmm. We've all been there. I've been there. I've walked into my classroom and left everything at the door. Mm -hmm. Um. But that and sometimes obviously we have is to, because we have to. But as our adult, as adults, we can do that. Mm-hmm. Children can't, not so easily, anyway. Especially the youngest children. Mm-hmm. 
And it's about that noticing. It's about, as you say, Aaron said, um, having that time. And mm-hmm. time is really difficult in early year settings these days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All so all if we can... Um, <laughs> sorry? All the routines, but then um, also... It's all those the routines. Kind of it's it's the that stuff that people... Around. It goes back to buying in packages. And it's about the labels, the golden mm-hmm. time. The circle time worries me to an extent mm-hmm. because not all children want to talk in circle time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not something they – and they may not have the vocabulary. Yeah, definitely. And well, there's well, nothing wrong. I used to say a lot to my class, there's nothing wrong with being the audience, being the listener, because we all need someone mm-hmm. who listens. And it reminds me of children having the right to silence. That's a big exactly thing that. that. We don't always, we, we, not many people know, you know, that part of the UNCRC, there is the right to silence. That's what it talks I about. I do wonder not about just, not a lot of people know yes. about the United Nations rights of the child, actually. Mm-hmm. <laughs> not a lot of people know a lot of statutory documents. So I mm-hmm. think my, my core message is really for practical things are... Spend five minutes. And even when you've got the pressure, if you're in a school of literacy, our, uh, sorry, literacy, numeracy, phonics, packaging in all this assessment, we have all five minutes, which may be 10 minutes to spend to mm-hmm. actually look at these children and think, are they happy? Mm-hmm. Am I happy? Mm-hmm. Are they doing these things like a sheet, for example? I dread to say the word. Are they doing this because I've told them to, or are they actually enjoying it and getting something from it? Mm -hmm. Are they involved? And times I walk into settings and the adult will say to me, look at how involved that group is over there. They're not. They're doing it because an adult's asked them to. Mm -hmm. And they'll walk away from it and leave it. Mm -hmm. And that's not good for well-being and emotional understanding. So it's about reading body language and body language is important because if you're asking a child to sit for 45 minutes and they're four or five years old, they're not going to be listening and happy anymore. Of course. And it's not about treats for the adults or the children on Friday Mm -hmm. because um, what did you say just now about rewards? It's extrinsic rewards, isn't Mm -hmm. it? It's done like that. Mm -hmm. You can have an ice cream on Friday. Well, thank you. But Friday's four days away. (laughs) Uh, It's about how do those children know that you as an adult value them Mm. and you've taken time to have a little chat because you know they've got a cat or a favourite toy or -hmm. something like that. It's about your team around you knowing that they are valued as well. Mm-hmm. And it's not just about writing in your diary, oh, I've got to buy them pizza on Friday. Mm-hmm. It's actually that they know that if you're the leader or if you're in the, working with lots of colleagues, everybody gets it. And then if you go in feeling very low, someone will notice and say, look, mm-hmm. you go have a cup of yeah. tea. I'll work with your children for a minute. Yeah. And it's it's like uh, reminding me of the unique child. It's understanding each unique member of your team, isn't it? Actually, do you know what? In Birth to Five Matters, there's a whole bit reinterpreting the principles, the unique child, etc., from the terms of the adult. Oh, well, I'll have to have a look at that. (laughs) That's really useful. I'm glad you said that, actually, because Mm -hmm. it looks at it from the terms of the adult as well, which I think is really important. But the crucial thing keeps rolling back to time. Mm-hmm. and actually valuable use of time and not just thinking, oh, I better remember to buy the treats for Friday. Mm-hmm. And it's not yeah. about empty words either. It's not about, oh, that's a lovely picture. Put it in the home box. <laughs> if you haven't even looked at it. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, well, it kind of reminds me of that slow pedagogy, isn't it, that Alison Clark talks about. Yep. Um, and really slowing down, taking a step back with yourselves with your team with the children and parents as well and carers absolutely but as as i also remember the that emotional and physical well-being is all about the entire body not just what happens in here mm-hmm. so look at your children in your environment look at your adults is the environment comfortable for them mm-hmm. um i mean as i say i'm conscious now that my background is quite distracting how distracting mm-hmm. is your environment at your setting Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the children walk in and think 
Yeah. So many children need that calm space, that home from home kind of feel. Um, those neutral aesthetics, that's something that I have always, back when I worked in practice and with different settings, something that I would always kind of go in and discuss with the practitioners. And I think it's difficult because there's that, we've always done it this way. We've always had primary colours in the classroom or in a setting and it's difficult to move away from that change. But you've got to look at research, you know, and what, how our children yeah, feel if they're overstimulated. On, yeah, on the Harvard, mm-hmm. is it the Harvard site? I can't remember, I can never remember what it's called, but the, the whole website um, about how the environment distracts the child and how distracted children can't learn in inverted commas, but also mm-hmm. as well, what does the environment make sense to the child? If it's completely covered with words and numbers and expectations, for want of a better word, Mm-hmm. What message is that giving the child? Mm-hmm. And what message is it giving the adults as well? Mm-hmm. So there's all sorts of inherent things going yeah. on there, mm-hmm. um, which make our working lives and those of the children very uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And if we're not comfortable emotionally and physically, emotionally and physically in our environments, then how can we expect the children to be? Well, yeah, that's a very good point. It's reflecting on the whole of the setting, how everybody feels and not just... And I am in no way underestimating the way that pressure is put on adults Mm -hmm. nowadays. I know that. I work in lots of schools and settings and I get the external pressures that are put on, especially at this time. I don't know when this web webinars going out but especially at this time of year when there's so much assessment going on yeah just before um kind of the the end of the academic year really yeah. isn't it there's, and there's, there's a loads of, of pressure i get that but unless you have a pressure release button so to speak mm. like on a pressure cooker mm-hmm. it's not going to do anybody any good well that's what i was going to say as well when you mentioned you know you, it's not just about treats on a friday and well-being on a friday um because it's too late by then it's absolutely too you're, late. You're gonna you're gonna burn out. You're gonna have that breakdown. You know you, you need it now. It's some, it's kind of like spotting the signs before um, th- those kinds of anxieties hit you. Those stresses hit you. It's spotting those signs early with yourselves, with the children, with your exactly. Team. And it's not about um, letting them out onto the playground to run off steam mm-hmm. or. Oh, one of the one of my biggest bugbears is an interactive whiteboard and you bring up some kind of dance routine or something. Mm. That to me isn't natural. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, we schedule that in for break time or we schedule that in after break or something like that. Just turn on a sixpence and stop, read the room. And mm-hmm. if the room is getting uptight and you're feeling yourself getting uptight, stop. Yeah. Have a laugh. Mm -hmm. Do something silly. Play a game. Do something, I mean, definitely do something physical, always Mm -hmm. physical. Yeah. But don't do it at a set time because that's not how it works. We can't. (laughs) Yeah, you're right. We can't schedule well being. We can't schedule mental health in. You absolutely can't. (laughs) Um, I talked about Catherine and her emotional backpack just now. I have lots of chats with her online and I was very fortunate to meet her in real life when we all went to India recently. But she says when we've had a Zoom call, she'll say, right, go outside now and touch something natural. Go and touch a tree or a plant. And I think that's a really good one. With nature, with something living. Yeah. (laughs) When you just need a little bit more life inside you. A bit of Tai Chi. And sometimes when I'm running a class and I've had loads of people in conference rooms doing this, I'll suddenly say, right, OK, we need to stop now because we've talked too long. Mm-hmm. Let's stand up and do whatever yeah. just to break the moment. And we have a laugh and we do whatever it is I've asked them to do, Tai Chi move wise. <laughs> and it breaks the moment and then mm-hmm. people come back again, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I guess thinking practically as well, it's about we all kind of tune into uh, I don't know podcasts reading and and things like that around mental health but it's about bringing that into our work with children as well and our teams and relating that 
because we kind of see life outside of the setting oftentimes as separate. But actually, if we listen to these experts around mental health and well-being, the, the thing that they say is the most important thing is moving. Exercise is what helps you kind of get out of that rut. Exercise kind of gives you that rebalance and refocus. Um, so what you're saying about physical movement, physical development, you know, just the act of stopping and, and having a bit of a wiggle, you know, for the children. and just Yeah, but not something around. that comes off the interactive whiteboard <laughs> which no, is very staged say, it's Make not it authentic fun. have a yeah. laugh no it's not authentic mm-hmm. it's spontan- spontaneity mm-hmm. I've had many a person as I say lying on the floor doing something in a conference just don't go there <laughs> <laughs> um, but also enjoy enjoy sharing what you love to do with the children and let them share what they enjoy doing you find out so much more about it mm-hmm. about yeah. them and how you can teach from that I guess if it you goes knit back to bring some knitting in you know that kind mm-hmm. of thing if you open up to the children then they open up more to you yeah. and it's it's that and then you again, feel better that connectedness mm-hmm. yeah yeah so there's an awful lot going on here but to bring it back to the beginning it is not mm-hmm. about treats on a friday mm-hmm it certainly isn't and yeah it's it's um it's about that connectedness that tuning into each other connectedness that's perfect well i think on that note then we will wrap it up here yep um uh, we're actually recording this on a Saturday. Um, thank you very much, Sue. <laughs> At the so, crack um, of dawn. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I'll um, I'll uh, I'll have to let you go. And um, to our listeners, I'll say that you can access more reading around well-being and mental health, both for children and educators, on the Voice of Early Childhood website. And Thank you very much, Dr. Sue Allen, for thank you. joining us. And thanks from Teddy Edward and his friends as well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Teddy Edwards, and thank you, Sue. Brilliant. Thanks, Angelica. Lovely to talk again, as always. And you. We'll speak soon. Yep. Bye.